Well, welcome back to all you ocean people who learned how to swim yesterday. That's what I was told you were doing. Are you ready? As you know, it was so quiet with them gone. I, I don't know, man. I, next time I'm going to say, I only want non-ocean people. They don't have to go learn how to swim. All right. We had already discussed the edge distance requirements on these things and how strong these things were in bearing. We found out that you had to determine how strong a little plug being pushed in front of the bolt was when you pull the plate to the right and crashed it into the bolt. That was that shearing stress was called a bearing limitation. You also had to make sure that the bolt, when it crunched into the plate, didn't crunch into it any more than a quarter inch. They were two separate distinct limits. The way it's written, even in the specs, it says tell me the shear plug number and make sure it doesn't exceed the crush a quarter of an inch number, but they're just two separate things. you got to calculate them both anyway. Write them down and take the smaller of the two. Some edge distance requirements are listed as L sub E in a table depending on the size of the bolt. <clears throat> and that does actually also pertain to this L sub E, this L sub E, so they call that L sub E also, but it's not got anything to do with the strength. They're just trying to keep that bolt away from the load, uh, keep it away from the edge. And then, of course, they also have to keep it away from this edge. And this is the one that's used in the calculation of the shear plug strength. <coughs> Quick summary was that the nominal strength without... Uh, factor a resistance factor on it yet was 1.2 times the clear length. In this case, this was the clear length. That would be the L sub E minus half of a hole with only 1 16th added to the drill size. And this would be the clear length, which would be the spacing of the bolts minus a complete hole size, that would be diameter of the bolt plus 1 16th instead of 2 16ths, because we don't care that that steel was messed up, it's underneath the head of a bolt, and we're getting ready to crunch the heck out of it anyway, so it won't get any worse than it was. We still count it in this case. Spacings were, had to be greater than 2 and 2 thirds of the diameter of the bolt, preferably 3D. Here were the specs and where we have it in our notes. The LCB had to be bigger than a thing came out of a table. I'm not sure we saw that table, but I guess we already did because <clears throat> I don't see it in front of us, so it must have been behind us. But it was based on the size of the bolt, and it told you uh, the limits on how close these things can get together, the minimum spacing. So for an example, I think, I don't know if we got started on this one, doesn't matter. Got to check bolt spacing edge distances and bearing strengths for by either in the wrong class or he says, I can't take another one of these. <laughs> don't know which. Check the bolt spacing edge distances and bear. Oh, okay. He's coming in. I thought he was leaving connection drawn in so-and-so, so here's the connection, nice little plate, got four bolts in it, that's the plate, that's the gusset plate. This is probably connected to a column or something like this. This may be a bracing member, maybe 20, 30 feet long. It'll have to be checked for stretchiness, gross section yield, it'll have to be checked for net section fracture, it'll have to be checked for all kinds of stuff, just like before. Added stuff will be bearing strengths and shear strength of the bolt, which we haven't done yet. So according to the table, it's on page 385A. How could I miss that? It's not on 385A. Yeah, it is on page 385A, but I must have stole it 
put it back earlier in the text or in the notes. Anyway, you go to this table, and he tells you you want two and two-thirds D for the minimum spacing. And he has got two and a half. Let me go back up to the picture here. He's got two and a half for the spacing, and so those spacings are okay. I wonder where I've got that. Let me see if I can find it right quick. Table, 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 table. Somebody stole my table. Pull that out of your book right quick. It is table, well, let me just tell you what page it's on, because I usually at least always tell you that. 16.1-123. Uh, and I believe it, I just want to make, I just want to hear you say it. For our bolts, we are using uh, three-quarter inch diameter bolts. Is that table a function of the bolt size? No, I can't. Come on, man. No, 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 don't bring it up here. I can't see it up here. Any... To the edge of the connection. So, and, and so what does it have for a three-quarter inch bolt? One inch, okay. See, and that's what he says. Actual distance we're using one and a quarter greater than one. So right from the horse's mouth, that's right out of this table on this page. So we're okay on spacing. Now we're going to find out how strong these things are. For computation of bearing strength, we're only going to add one sixteenth to the whole size. So that we'll be able to get our little plug lengths in here by cutting by taking off half of a hole diameter. So we have thirteen sixteenths inch hole, not a D plus an eighth inch hole. Check the bearing on both the tension member and the gusset plate. So just for what we're doing, this is all for the tension member. We'll do the gusset plate on the next page. What we're doing, we're doing bearing strengths. What we're doing first, it is a version of bearing strength. It is the shear strength of the plugs. And here it is for the end holes. And here's the shear strength on the tension member for interior holes. So it's all divided up into what in the world we're doing here. Check the bearing strength on both the tension member and the gusset plate. Gusset plate comes later. Tension member, the holes nearest the end edge of the member, because this dimension could be one and be legal. And if you think that we're calculating the bearing stress strength on this one inch dimension and use that, you get it wrong. The only thing I need that is to just meet the the uh, specs. This is the one where we pull the plug out, so this is the one, even though it's the same in this case, that I'm calculating. The clear length would equal to L sub E, that's the distance from the hole to the end, one and a quarter, minus the new hole size over two, 1360 over two. The little plug that's shearing out of here will be this long. The normal, uh, the nominal strength of the resistance is 1.2 times that number times the thickness of the plate times the ultimate stress. Check it out if you don't remember what that is. <clears throat> and it must not exceed the crush strength of the plate. Uh, that crush strength was measured at a deflection of about a quarter inch worth of crush in the plate. Continuing with what we're doing here, here's our 1.2 L clear, 0.84 inches, times the thickness of the plate in tension, times the F sub U of the A36 steel plate, 29 kips worth of strength. That prevents shearing out a metal plug. Then to check, I don't like that upper limit, it's, it is an upper limit, but to check crushing to prevent excessive deformation of a quarter inch, you have the second limit state, 2.4, diameter bolt, thickness of plate, F sub U. 
2.4, diameter of the bolt, thickness of the plate, F sub U, 52. So of the two types of bearing limits, pulling the little plug out is the limit. And he says that here. Since the plug pull is less than the plate crush, use the 29 for this hole. Now for the interior holes, we do the same thing. The L clear changes because we're not using L to the end. We're using the distance between the drilled bolts, which was two and a half inches minus a half a hole minus a half a hole. I didn't see that or understand, raise your hand. Tie, and that's the clear length. That's the shear plug length. The nominal resistance is 1.2 times that clear length times thickness F sub U. And yeah, it has to be less than that. But just getting back to this number here, so you don't confuse it with some other thought in the meantime, here's your 1.2. Here's your 1.688. Here's the thickness of the plate. There's your F sub U. Gives you 58 kips of strength for the plug shear strength. Now, once you've calculated 2.4 diameter of the bolt thickness of the plate F sub U, it's the same for all the bolt holes. You won't ever need to calculate that again because you'll notice the length of anything isn't in there. Length to the end is not in there. Spacing is not in there. It's just a function of the bolt size, thickness of the plate, F sub U, and the constant necessary to get the right answer that agrees with theory and mostly test. So once you had this uh, 52.2, that's it. For all the other bolts. Oh, here it says right here, same for all bolts. And I scratch this out. The result means that the L sub clear or L sub N, either one, small enough so that it will control. It must be accounted for. Well, everything has to be accounted for, but it controlled. So the crushing upper limit, which was as before, 52.2, is compared against the new plug, the sh uh, shear the plug out. And in this case, the crushing number controlled. So what's that saying is on one of them, the plug shear controlled, and the other one, the crushing limit controlled. So that's what he did. Came over and he said, the bearing strength of the tension member, we have two bolts where shear plugs control, plus two times where the crushing of the plate controls gives us a potential bearing strength of 163. A little early to be calculating that, really, because we don't know about the bolts yet. If we don't know the bolt shear strength, that's the only thing they have to do with anything from now on, then it's possible none of these numbers control. We'll have to see. Now we calculate the gusset plate. And you do it, 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 and as you dang, numbers sure do look about the same. And then you look back at these numbers here, and you say, dang, every number in there is identical. The only difference is the plate is not the same thickness. It's no longer half inch thick. It's three eighths th thick, but it has the same F sub U, has the same bolt bearing against it has the same constant necessary to make it real world. And so there's no reason for this. You might as well just go get the number you had in the first place, which was 161, multiply it times the thickness of the new plate, divided by the thickness of the old plate. I think uh, when Kahootik was around, he knew this guy real well. He says, kind of curious. He says, well, it's if you make them practice with it twice, they understand it better, and they're so mad you made them do it twice, they never forget it. Point. So the strength could be up to 122 kips. Nominal, all of these are R sub N, still need a fee of 0.75, a resistance factor that is to be applied to this failure type of behavior. Oh, here he does it. 
No, no, no. This is the this is here's the design strength. There's his fee, times the one twenty two. And evidently back there he told us the dead and the live loads. So one point two dead, one point six live was ninety, less than the ninety one point seven needed. And so the whole system, as far as bearing is control is is con considered, it's okay. But until he tells me what kind of bolt he's going to stick in there, if they're crummy bolts, this whole thing may be no good at all. So now we get into how strong the bolts are in shear. I can tell you now the bolts are tremendously strong in bearing. And so they have no, no, no bearing, no pun intended. They don't have any bearing on the bearing stress calculations almost ever. The plates are always much weaker in bearing than are the bolts. Basically, the allowed load would be equal to whatever shearing stress you're going to pit, permit me to put in there times the area of the bolt in shear, whatever the area of the bolt happens to be, or whatever you consider the area of the bolt to be. For example, if you have a bolt and you cut the shank, you cut all of the area that's in there. If, on the other hand, you consider that you have cut threads in it and you think that's the area over which the load is distributed, then you would use what we call the root area. If, because it's impossible to cut through a bolt without at least picking up one thread then you might have the calculation of this area plus how much area is in a thread when it gets cut also be a little higher. That would be called the tensile stress area. But our basic equations would be uh, here's R nominal is equal to whatever nominal stress you're going to let me put in there in shear times the area of the bolt, whatever you choose to use. And then, of course, you're going to have to make sure that R sub U is less than phi times that number, which is equal to, this is less than, uh, phi F sub N shear, nominal shear, area of the bolt. My guess is when we go for this number here, you're going to see something called F sub U in there, and you're going to multiply it times what number? 0 0.6. That's correct. Now, admittedly, the bolt people are the people who do this, so they may not pick a point six. You and I, for all of our plate steels, have always taken the shear numbers as point six of so the tension numbers, whether they were ultimate or whether they were yield. But we still got to get the bolt people's opinion because they're the experts. Now, we have rivets. I think we mentioned those before, little slugs of metal that they heat up, throw it up to the floor necessary. Guy, or the lady puts it in one side of the thing to be connected, and the person on the other end bangs a head on the end of the rivet and then lets it cool, and it gets pretty tight, and it does a job. It doesn't have a calculable, I mean, a, a consistent tension in it, so you really can't count on any friction between the two pieces. They just aren't that strong, and it's not that consistent. Then we have common unfinished bolts. Typical one would be called an A307. Uh, they're just uh, what they call common bolts. The common, unfinished, and they have some good strength. They were used for years. The rivet people were screaming, they're no good. They're going to fatigue. They're going to break. All your buildings will fall in a few years. You know, but we started using them. They're, they're able to be installed by somebody less skilled. Somebody who does this work here has got to at least be accurate in throwing things at people, or you'll have these things down all people's back of their shirts. This can be put together by somebody. You give him a wrench. You say, you know what to do. He says, no, and you show him once, and that's it. Good to go. High-strength bolts, then. These are not high-strength bolts. High-strength bolts come in two groups, high-strength and really high-strength. We usually use A325 as a typical bolt or an A490 as a typical bolt. 
I don't know what the strength of these things is. I got a table of uh, these, which I'll show you in a minute. Here's information on how they're made, what they're made. They have higher tensile strength when they came into general use. You ought to read this so you're just not ignorant about it. Some of these numbers, like the 2280 bolts, they're pretty much the same as these bolts, but they are made so that they have a little twist-off tail on them, and I'll show you how they're used so that you can tighten them to a very close accuracy. Uh, these two bolts, you can tighten them up so tight that you clamp the two surfaces together reliably and you get a lot of the load carried in friction between the two plates. Uh, old notes, really old notes, used for the sketches only. Here's a pair of plates to be joined. One's thick, one's thin. Here's the bolt put in there. You'll notice the threads only come up here in a short distance. Therefore, the bolt is sheared through the shank. I don't see one where this happened, but basically it was threaded to the head. And therefore, this one was sheared through the uh, root area, or if you think you deserve it, the root area plus one thread. It's what they call a tensile stress area. That is, incidentally, the same stress area if you pull the bolt in tension because you have to break it around the root, but then when it gets around to the bottom of that, it has to kick up back to this top of the uh, bolt, and you do get a little more area inside of the uh, thread itself. Here is uh, here's the little twist off thing on the bolt. Here are the threads. You put a special tool on there. It holds onto this piece and it turns the nut on the bottom. When this little piece breaks off, uh, you got the right tension in the bolt. They all start off bolts looking like that. Here's a bolt in double shear. That's probably excessively drawn because it's only supposed to be uh, about a quarter inch of gouge in the plate, and it probably wouldn't do that to the bolt. Here's a washer that they put between the head, uh, the nut, and the plate. Uh, they have little square things pushed out on them. The, it's, it's not pushed out here, not pushed out here, and they push the little thing down in there and break it loose here such as these little pieces stick up. And since this sticks up, it would take a lot of pressure to push it down back in the hole. And what they do is, here's the head of the nut, or head of the, yeah, that's the nut. I think they use that end. Here's the nut. Right now, a feeler gauge goes in there, no problem. But when you crank this nut down just the right amount to push this little thing back in the hole from whence it came, you can just barely get a gauge of a certain size in there, and that means you have pulled that head of that nut down and caused the right pressure uh, between the head of the nut and the connected uh, surfaces. I have no idea what that's for. Load comes like this. Comes down, comes through the plate, comes around the backside, bears against the bolt, the bolt pushes this way, bears against something wrong there. Goes like that. One of the things wrong with having these things not threaded to the head is you got to make sure they install them from the right side. Because you had one like this and the bolt was not threaded to the head and you're counting on it cutting through the threads, uh, if you install it the wrong way, the threads would be, you know, in the plane of shear when you didn't want it to be. Weren't counting on it on being. Typical table off the internet. There's your grade A bolt. I'm sorry. That's a uh, common unfinished. That's your A307. That's uh, lower medium carbon steel. Here's your tensile strength right here. You're going to get some percent of that, probably 
Here are your A325, Group A, high strength. Wow, look at that tensile stress, 120. As soon as they're up to about an inch and a half bigger than that, they go down, obviously. They have more defects that you haven't gotten out by making them smaller. And then here are your A490. Those are one of the ones in Group B. 150,000 PSI, of which case the bolt people are going to let you have some percentage of that in shear. The heads look like A307s don't have any markings. A325 say A325. The A490s say A490. So it should be pretty easy to know which ones are there when you go inspect the place. Chief distinction between the 307 and the uh, Type A and the Type B, Group A, Group B, the high strength bolts can be tightened to produce a predictable tension in the bolt, and that will produce a calculable clamping force and a calculable friction between the sliding surfaces. A307 rarely used today. Nominal strength based on the ultimate tensile stress of the bolt with several modifications. First, the ultimate shear stress is, oh, son of a gun. It's not 0.6. Why not? Talk to the bolt people. I uh, don't remember if I had a slide on that. If I don't, I probably do in a minute where you can download the whole thing for free. We get a 0.625 for bolts as opposed to the 0.6 for the plates. And that's according to these people, and the references are listed in Segui. It says, note there's a length factor of 0.9 for the connection lengths no longer than 38 inches. In other words, I don't care how short it is, there's a 0.9 on it. Once it gets over 38 inches long, then we're going to make you cut it down to point, uh, where, where, where? 0.75. That 0.75 is not your fee. At 0.75 is because you have such a long connection, it's kind of hard to get the stretchiness in the plate to distribute the load in the bolts. If the threads are in the plane of shear, the reduction of the bolt angle is accounted for by using 80% of the nominal bolt area and leaving the allowed stress alone. Now, what that what that really means is, is they're going to give you, I think I said that wrong, if the threads are in the plane of the shear, the reduction of the bolt area is actually, uh, it's accounted for, it's actually about 80% of the nominal bolt area, the shank bolt area. And what they're going to do is rather than make you, remember I told you you're going to have to go in the table and find the area of the bolt, the shank area? Well, you don't have to go on the table for that. It's pi d squared over 4. But to get the tensile area or the root area, you're going to have to know how that thing was uh, made. You're going to have to know this dimension here, this dimension here, and you're going to have to know the area of a thread. You have to figure all that out. They say, we don't want that. I say, well, you've got to do something because if you cut the shank, you get your nice pi d squared over 4. He says, we're going to let them use that for everything. You're kidding. You can't do that. The, there's a, if it cuts through the threads, there isn't as much area by a lot. He says, well, what we're going to do is if they have it cut through the shank, we're going to give them one allowed stress. And if they cut through the threads, we're going to let them use the same area, but we're just going to dock them with a little less allowed stress. Well, all right, I want to see how you did that. He says, not a problem. So if the threads are in the plane of shear, well, the reduction of the bolt area, he says, is about 80%. So I guess they're going to let me only have 80% of the stress. Instead of applying this reduction directly to the bolt area, a factor of 0.8 is applied to the stress. This way, you don't have to go get the area out of a table. You just... Take 80% of the stress. 
Okay, so let me see you calculate this. He says, okay, well, say the threads are excluded from the shear plane. In other words, it really cuts through the shank. How much stress do they get? Well, they get 120 for a group A bolt. Let me check that. A group A bolt. A, yeah, that's a good group A bolt. Uh-huh, there you go, 120,000. Times 0.625, I th would have thought of 0.6, but they say, look, we know more than you do. Times 0.9, because we're assuming that your length of your connection will be not over 38 inches. If it is, come see me. we got another number for you right there. So you get 67.5 KSI permitted. Okay, now let's talk about this threaded, if it cuts through the threads. Well, it says if the threads are in the shear plane, in other words, they are included, like not excluded, fine with me, then you get eight-tenths of that stress, which means 54. So, well, okay, I guess my only question is that number you said was 0.8 right here. Where'd you get that 0.8 from? It says, well, go look at any bolt chart. All right, this one comes out of the AISC specs. Screw threads, they're called. Okay. Bolt diameter. Okay. Let's say a one-inch bolt has a pi d squared over 4 using 1 as the d of 0 0.785. That's right, because pi over 4 is 0 0.785. 1 squared is 1. And he says, I know the root area, and I know the root area plus a thread. Okay, and he says, well, divide the root, the threaded area, the tensile area, where you cut through the threads plus a, plus a thread, divide it by the shank, what do you get? I say, well, 0 0.606 over 0 0.785. So I don't get 0 0.8. He says, don't give me that. How close is it? Three. Out of what? 77. He says, do you ever get numbers that close? He says, go away. He says, well, wait, I want to check one more. It's an inch and three-eighths, 1.16 divided by 1.49, 0 0.79. 0 0.8 is in the specs. That's where it comes from. Rather than making you come find the real area, which is really just 0.8 times the shank area, he puts it on the allowed stress. But you should know that. You really should. You should know that the permitted stress in a piece of steel doesn't change just because you put threads on it. The area may change because you put threads on it, regardless of how they try and make it simple to use. There was the one I was thinking about. Here's a person who wanted to cut through the shank, and so they made sure the bolt was only threaded up to a certain point, and they got to keep track of them, of course. And then they got to make sure the plate thicknesses are right because you can't use this on a three-quarter by three-quarter plate because not enough will stick out. And in this case, if they put it in upside down, it won't matter because it would still cut through the shank. But you got to be careful that you don't have like a two-inch plate connected to a one-inch plate, and you put the things in the wrong way, then you'll cut through the threads that you hadn't planned on. This is excluded. This is in. Included. Here is the table from the AISE specs. A307 is good for 27 KSI shear. You don't get to say the threads are included or not. In that kind of a bolt, the threads always used to be included, and they, they're just as whether they are or not. You can't count on them. For group A, if they are excluded, then you get what we said, 120 times 0.65 times phi. Wait a minute. Is that phi? I thought phi was supposed to be 0.75. Let me see something. Hardy? Hardy here today? Hardy? What's that 0.9 for? 
Don't feel bad. I don't know either. If I knew, I wouldn't have asked you. Gamble? Where's Gamble? There's Gamble. What's that point nine for? Well, yeah, this one here. No, this one over here. Yeah, that one there. Anybody? The area is nine tenths. Is that right? I thought that area thing was point eight. What's that point nine for? Less than 38 inches. You say, dang, man, you told us 83 things. You expect us to remember one of them? No. But I have fun watching you squirm. It's because the connection is assumed to be 38 inches or shorter. What's it going to be? Does anybody remember what it was if it gets longer than that? Very good. 0.75. That is correct. So you get a 68, and down in the notes here, he's going to tell you that if you uh, have a thing longer than 38 inches, he's going to definitely tell you right here what you get instead of this number. Now then, going to where the threads are not excluded, the threads are included in the shear plane, you get the 68, and the only other factor is the 0.8 due to the reduction in area. So you use this stress based on pi d squared over 4. Which is wrong, which is wrong. Now, whoever said two wrongs don't make a right, we're not engineers. I just want the point eight in there someplace. Here it is for the higher strength. You start with 150 with the same numbers, and you get 84, and the 84 for threaded drops to 68. And some other th items. Oh, this is interesting. Now, Right here, they're talking about the nominal shear strength. And here it was a shank area. Here it was cutting through a smaller area, so I understand that drop. Uh, here are the tensile strengths. Here it is uh, excluded, and here it's included. They're the same numbers. Why does it not change as you go from threads excluded to threads included? Tension. Intention. Intention. Because it's the same, isn't it? When you put tension on a bolt, the bolt gets loaded right on down through the shank and goes where? Down to the threads. You can't stop it from going through the threads. So the area is the same for both of these types of connection. Intention. So the nominal strength of your bolt is the 120 times 0.75, we'll get into that later, for 90 KSI good worth of tension. So here's a simple connection. Got two bolts. Wants you to check it for A307. Group A uh, threads in the plane and group A threads not in the plane. Bearing stresses, the bearing strengths, I don't really have any new comments to tell you. Go through the calculations for bearing. Check the shear out of the plug for the end bolt. Check the crushing of the plate at the end bolt, and then realize it's good for the end bolt or any other bolt. Plate crushing. Here's what you'll find. You'll find the strength to shear out a little end plug was 28. You'll find the shear to pull out a little plug down in the middle where the spacing is much larger was 57. You'll find the crushing was 28, and the crushing is 28 everywhere. Then you go to bolt shear. Now, let me see... But that's for a different case. One of the things you really need is you need kind of like a summary sheet of what you're finding on these, because you'll find plate pu or yeah plug pullout of 28 here and plug pullout of 57 for this one because it's so much longer. Then you'll find plug crushing of 39. You'll find plug crushing of all of them 39. Then you'll find that if that was it, that's all we've done so far, then you would say the total load on that plate would be the sum of what two numbers? 
The lower of the two is the generic response, and your individual response was getting ready to be 28 plus 39. Those are both correct. Now then, when we went and got the shear strength of the bolt, we haven't done that yet. That one was 30, and of course, then the shear strength of all of them are 30. And you took the lower of this set, so this was a 28. You took the lower of this set, and this was a 30. And so you got that much strength for one bolt, that much strength for the other bolt. Then your fee gave you the strength. But you have to do these people one at a time. You can't just go get the strength in bearing and say, okay, that's one thing. And then you get the strength in shear for all the bolts, and that's one thing. And you take the lower of the two that doesn't work. Every little bolt against every little hole has to, you have to find out how strong it is. And if it's not the same strength up here because different people control, you have to keep tabs of that. So now here's our first bolt shear. The bearing and shear strength can't be considered independently. That's what he's saying here. You've got to get the individual strength at each bolt location, take the minimum of the bearing, Either one, out of the shear strength, used at that bolt location. It says it's explained in this spec at these pages in the user notes. And here they are right here. You look around for user's notes. You can't find them. You realize, okay, yeah, I can because they're gray. It says the effective length of an individual fastener is the lesser, lesser shear strength effective strength of the bearing strength at the bolt hole or the shear strength at the bolt hole. So here's what he's telling you, what Segui just told you. So now then, <clears throat> uh, the bolts in this connection are subject to single shear, so he's going to go ahead and get the area. He is not bolt dependent yet because the cross-section area, that's the only one you'll ever need, with or without cutting the threads. Now we start for A307 bolts. Nominal shear strength, let me check that right quick. Nominal shear strength, 27. 27 for A307 bolts. 27 times cross-sectional area gives me a nominal bolt strength of 11.93. This is smaller than everything in sight, all the bearing strengths. Therefore, we get 11.93 plus 11.93 because there's two bolts. Then we apply the resistance factor to take care of all that variation in these bolts. 17 kips is the permitted load. That includes bearing crushing the plate in shear. That includes bearing, excuse me, bearing pull out the plug in shear, bearing crushing the plate in shear, and bolt shear. Next, we do group A bolts with the threads in the plane of shear. These, these, this shear plane is, the threads are included in this plane of shear. Nominal strength is 54, 54, A325 bolts, A325 typical, uh, 68. No, 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 that's excluded. 54, that's included are included 54 that's the right allowed stress nominal stress we get that number times 0.4418 that is already taken into account that the connection is no longer than 38 inches this one right here this is already taken into account uh, the fact that the thing is being cut through the threads it's also including the fact that uh, uh, what else was in that mess one other number in that mess. Oh, the 0.625. Instead of my 0.6 that I keep telling them, 0.625. Gets that much load, nominal strength for the shear in the bolt. Nominal strength of shear in the bolt is still smaller than any of the bearing numbers we had, and therefore uh, you get that much nominal and you get that much permitted. Then for the strong bolts, the A325 was stronger because the threads aren't cut, X, 
We got group A. When they're not cut, gotcha, understand. When it is not cut, you go to 68. Hello, hello, 68, 68, 68. Uh, excluded A325, 68. And uh, 68 times the area is 30.04. It says that the hole nearest the edge, the bearing strength back there was only 28. I said, well, I never controlled before. He says, well, look back there. You're going to find that this number was only 28. So now then, the shear strength of the bolt is stronger than the bearing strength at the hole nearest the edge. So you're going to have to tell Mr. Bolt, sorry you're so strong, but we don't get to use your number. We use the bearing strength at the, at the hole in the end of the plate. Do you remember? I don't remember whether this was a crush or a plug pull. But I don't care. We got both the numbers. We have to go back and look and see which one it was. It's less than the bolt shear strength. The word bolt ought to be added to your notes. Reason is, there's a lot of shear strengths going on in here. There's a shear strength of a plug. At the other hole, the bolt shearing strength is still 30.04, but at the bolt shearing hole, we had a bearing strength. The worst one was 39. So now then the bolt controls. So we get one where the plug or the crushing control, I bet you that was plug because it was so close. Plus 30 for the bolt, 59. Bearing of the plug, there we go. No, that's just bearing. It doesn't tell you what kind of bearing. Plus bolt shear. Therefore, you get 0.75 of that once you use that type of bolts. All edge spacing requirements and so on and so forth. So this is where I think you do well if you're not sure what to take. As you get them, just write them down. Plug pull out was 28. For him, plug pull out for him was 57. Plug crush was 39 on the end. That tells us which, where that came from. And plug crushing is 39 everywhere. And bolt shear is 30, and it's that everywhere. And so you add up who you can have. You can only have that number. And you can only have that number and that's why they took that number plus that number and multiplied times 0.75 and got the load on the bolt, on the plate. Now, a little later on, they're going to say that we are going to design these things uh, as if all the bolts take the same load. That's not quite true. As you notice right now, all the bolts are not taking the same load. So that's not a, a, a limitation, but it is only true if the bolts control everything. And I'll tell you now, we usually try and make these things so the bolts do control everything. Now, if you start going in there and start finding that this thing here is controlling, your best bet probably to move it back a little so it doesn't control. And you want to know it doesn't control before you start designing your bolts. So you can say, when you design my bolts, I, uh, the bolts will control, and therefore I know how many bolts I need. All right. See you next time. When is Quiz A coming up Wednesday? It's coming Wednesday? It's coming Friday. No, no, no. Anybody who controls is breaking. That's that's it. You, that's right. Well, see what. you want bearing? Because that's not actual fracture. That's just No, no, it's actual. It's just a stretch. Oh, it's a failure. It's a failure, yeah. Well, then are the bolts. No, 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 no. Though when I tell you that the bolts are going to fail at 54 ksi, they don't fail. They don't come apart. Uh, not at all. Guaranteed. And nothing comes apart anywhere. Now, if you run that, if you run that uh, number on up to, I don't know how many, maybe maybe 20% more on those bolts, 
then things bad may start coming apart. But when I say the plate failed in bearing and the bolt failed in shear, the word failed is only to keep you and me on the right side of a magic number. With a failing intention, I meant fracture. That's why we use the point seven five. That's why. Well, that keeps it away from that. Yeah. But they don't. They don't fail at that. For instance, when somebody tells you it's point seven five, that's one of the reasons they're keeping you away from that. Sorry, yes, sir. The plug pull. Yes. I understand the plug pull here is going to pull out here. That's correct. Edge, but how does this plug pull here on this? It side? just it just pops right out into this hole. Oh, okay. Okay. In other words, and of course, again, it doesn't really literally come out, but I mean, it is it's just pretty much lost all its strength at that time. Okay. Um, so when we say something fails, the anchor. That's correct. And does it really come apart and everybody dies? No. I mean, there's still a long room before that's going to happen. Okay.